Welcome back to Duckman Cycles and VW Garage. I'm your host, the Duckman. <laughs> We're back today with the ATVW that you see sitting right here behind me. And unfortunately, and I hate doing this to you guys, but I made a promise. And unfortunately, in this video, I'm not going to be able to follow through. This is one such time that I screwed up and... <laughs> I'm just not going to be able to give you what I promised. And what I promised you was a test ride in this video. And it can't happen because I had a problem. So if you're one of those guys that's going to go ahead and give me a thumbs down and just, you know, you're going to say some bad <laughs> shit, then just give me that thumbs down and get the hell out of here. Don't even bother with the bad stuff. Get the f*** <laughs> out! It's actually a rather interesting video. If you stick around, you can see some of the problem solving that I went through to try to fix what happened to this thing, and of course a little more about what we're doing and adding to this. I said there'd be separate phases to this this build. Uh, phase one would be getting it running and riding as fast as I can. And I think I accomplished that, even though I only rode it for probably about 30 seconds to a minute, maybe not even, and I started to have some issues which we're gonna cover in this video. But after that, when I got through those issues, well, I had a bigger one. <laughs> so I decided that maybe at this point, since it running and riding was the goal and I did get it, even though it was only a minute, that we probably need to start moving on to phase two and that's uh, upgrades and modifications. So that's what we're gonna get onto on this. Yeah, I know there's still a few things from phase one that we didn't finish yet, like the rear brakes, for example, but we'll get onto it when we get onto it. I don't think it's that big of a deal yet. The thing does stop very well with the front brakes, and we'll get on a little bit of that later in this video. So, uh, thanks you guys for watching. Really appreciate it. Don't forget to licky likey, comment, and subscribe unless you're one of the haters, and give me a thumbs down because it still counts as an engagement. I really do appreciate that. Thanks you guys so much for watching. We'll see you right after the intro. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for watching, as always. Well, where do we start? There's so much going on in this video. Even B was supposed to be here, but we forgot to record her when we did the mail call video, so... <laughs> Oops. <laughs> well, there's always a next time. I suppose first I should address what people have noticed in the last video and were so quick to jump to conclusions, yet again. But that's what people do. They're all so sure that they're right. You know how it goes. You gotta love those folks. <laughs> I wish I was so sure about things, like my bank account and my dating life. <laughs> but yes, there was some understeer on my first test ride, but understeer wasn't the cause of the issue. It was the result of a new problem. So it was not for the reasons of everyone that just kept continuing to tell me that the front end is too light. I'm not sure why the haters continue to dwell on that subject, but hey, at least they're commenting, right? <laughs> Well, what we had here was actually a compounded combination of problems. The first was that the front calipers kept dragging and sticking. This is obvious when you watch the extended clips of my test ride later in the last video. The master cylinder feels just fine, but the brakes would sometimes stick when least expected or drag badly. The left one was really bad in the dragging department. The second problem is, is that I'm already riding on slicks on a bed of pine needles, so I might as well just be riding on ice. Those two problems cause the wheels not to roll in the direction they're supposed to. The vehicle just plows the wheels in a straight line, skating over the pine needles like butter sliding across a hot pan. But the biggest problem of all that you didn't get to see, which I didn't include in the last video so as not to derail it with negative conversation, was the steering would go past its maximum angle. This caused the front wheels to cock really hard to one side, and the entire steering rack gets locked in that position. This was the reason I terminated my first ride. When I squeezed that brake, the left front wheel locked up, and the steering snapped a hard left going beyond its limits, and I almost crashed into my neighbor's work truck. Thankfully, I wasn't going that fast at all, and I quickly ground to a halt. But I did not expect that to happen, really, I, I just didn't. But I wish I had it on camera, because my reaction was truly genuine <laughs> but maybe next time I'll try to get that camera pointed at me because I just hate missing when something great happens like that since then I've taken the calipers apart on both sides and once again cleaned the pistons they now operate smoothly without sticking nor dragging anymore I probably need to replace those calipers with something new before this thing ever hits the road in modern traffic, but to stay consistent with the junk theme that this project was built upon, these parts should be staying on here for a little while longer at least. So I modified the Honda Foreman steering stops to prevent the steering from going too far. I just built up a little weld on each of the stops and then tested. Then the steering no longer had any crazy limit issues. Simple as it was, that was the correct fix here. This is just something I overlooked when I first put this together. 
So while I had the welder out, I also made a proper clip to attach the seat to, as sitting on the frame was really starting to hurt my ass. Oh, I'm not gay. You just do gay stuff. And while I was at it, I replaced the shifter. It just kept popping up and out of the shift rod cup and spinning around, making it impossible to get it into any gear at all. I remembered Wild Bill gave me a her shifter recently, and eventually it's going to end up on Eleanor. But in its unknown condition, I figured I wanted to give it a try, and it works great, so thank you, Bill. I'm still looking for a proper bus shifter to fit on here, and Declan Don actually called me this week about it and said he had one, and he'll be letting me know, so thanks, Don, for anything you turn up. I'll be seeing him this weekend at Tech Session, and maybe if I'm lucky, he'll have a shifter there for me. Well, before my next test ride, I wanted to demonstrate just how hard it is to pull the clutch, so I got out my crane scale and found it varied a bit sometimes, but required about 70 to 85 pounds of squeezing force. I was talking to a sports medicine doctor friend of mine some time ago, and she said that 70 to 75 pounds of grip force is normal among most men. But I had a flashback to my childhood, when my father tested his grip strength on a carnival machine. Now, I don't know how calibrated the machine was, or even if it was rigged, but I do remember him coming in at around 125 pounds. Everyone else in the family were women and children and were 50 pounds or less, except me. At 12 years old, I squeezed a 112, and with my left hand. My father was so impressed that he talked about that for years, and well, what I'm getting at here is that the clutch is incredibly hard to squeeze, it's still just barely manageable for me, let alone anyone else. Manual shift here in the USA is a theft deterrent, but with a clutch that stiff, most people can't ride this thing at all. <laughs> now I can use it, but after a couple dozen good pulls in succession, I get so fatigued that I have trouble pulling it as far as I need to to disengage the clutch entirely. It's just not fun. Well, all that matters not. I whipped out my tow bar because I was preparing to pull this thing to a local parking lot for a proper test ride video when... I thought it wouldn't hurt if I just took a quick test ride around the block before I left. Off camera, I went to take this thing out and, well, I didn't even make it out of the yard. That's when the clutch cable snapped. I was rather pissed off at that moment as I had promised you guys a proper test ride in the last video, but that can't happen now. Evaluating the cable, I honestly would have expected to have pulled out of the custom end that I put on the transmission side, but not so. Instead, on the stock Honda Foreman rear brake cable that was being used here, the top side end pulled off the cable and right out of the brake handle. With how difficult the clutch was to operate anyway, I already had plans for it, so I decided at this point it was time to commit to phase two of this project and reveal the next plan. This all comes prematurely, however, as I haven't finished gathering all the necessary expensive parts to make this work. A few people in the comments of previous videos are in alignment with the parts that I have been collecting here, and they kind of knew without even actually knowing. So, good job, you guys. <laughs> what you're looking at here is a brake booster servo. It's an inline model that should work in line with the hydraulic clutch. It came in a kit form and looks pretty thorough, with mounting brackets, hoses, lines, flare nuts, and all the nuts and bolts to get it set up. Units like this are rather popular for vintage cars that don't otherwise have provisions for boosted brakes. Depending upon my results with this thing, you may even see units like this on Gregory in the future. Also here among these parts, you can see a hydraulic clutch slave cylinder for a VW transmission, and a hydraulic clutch master cylinder for a hand lever. I also picked up a rebuild kit for this master cylinder. I seem to remember some time ago that this unit in the past was not pumping correctly. Um, maybe that's it, so, well, I hope this all works. So first I got the slave cylinder fitted. Not much to that thing at all. One nut on each end, right? That's all there was. Then I figured I had to find a proper mounting location for the servo. It's a fairly large part, but it should fit between the frame spars on the ATVW just okay. It's an ugly unit that neither looks VW nor Honda Foreman, so I just felt I needed to hide it. Up underneath the rear fenders and under the seat is probably the best spot. I wanted to not have to modify the bodywork to get this thing fitted, so, well, I mocked it up and quickly realized it was 90 degrees off to the left. It would probably work fine in this position, but the bleeder valve really should be at the top, so I changed how I mounted all this and made a new mounting bracket for it instead. Now that got it good, but it was still a little bouncy, and I feel I needed a mount on the opposite side of the vacuum canister to stabilize it. Well, I welded a tank to the frame there and bolted it in. It seems nice and solid, so let's go about routing the lines. The lines are going to be very interesting, and that's a nice way of saying it's going to be an extreme pain in the ass. There's about five different flare nuts and banjo bolts that are needed to be used here. The hydraulic cylinder uses an imperial threaded nut with an inverted double flare. Simple enough, as I have the tool to flare the lines for it. But the servo cylinder uses imperial threaded bubble flares. 
but they shipped inverted flare nuts with it. So while one of the nuts did work fine for the hydraulic cylinder, but the other nuts were completely wrong for the servo. So that kind of aggravated me a bit. Well, that means I just have to order the proper parts, and that means I'm gonna have to take this thing apart and reflare the ends yet again. I didn't figure this out until later, of course, when I found the lines were still loose even though the nuts were tight. Not good. Very bad. Gonna leak. The cable actuated clutch handle needed to come off to make way for the hydraulic unit. This is also from a Hayabusa like the front brake master cylinder on the opposite side. These are both parts out of my parts bin. It's very nice that they match and it might even help some of my OCD viewers out there. I used a rubber brake line from an early 2000s Honda CBR600 up front here. Like the master cylinder, it was just something I had around. Sure, I could have just bought a longer line and run it all the way to the back to the servo, but this is what I had and this will work fine. I had to figure out where I wanted to route the line as it needs to go into a junction. I used a typical VW rear brake T here. I will plug the remaining open end with a flare nut that I will just weld closed. Then I'll run some hard line to the junction all the way back to the servo. The flare nut at the front is a typical metric VW part, but the one at the servo is imperial threaded. Both ends, however, use the same bubble flare. That's kind of interesting. Hmm. Well, I got this situated, it looks good, but then I realized I need to replace the improper flare nuts as mentioned before. I also needed a VW threaded banjo bolt to attach the rubber line to the junction. Most of these things are very easy, and at the time of this recording, parts have already been ordered. Maybe we shall see them in the next video? Well, you know, I hope so. So thanks for watching, you guys. Don't forget to leaky likey, comment, and subscribe. Check out DuckShit.net for all my different social media links. You can also email me through my website using the contact link, or you can send me an email at DuckmanCycles at DuckShit.net. Yeah, I appreciate you guys always, so thanks so much. We'll see you next time.